Okay, so uh, apologies if I have a, uh, a coughing fit during the, the, the talk. I've had a sore throat for, it seems like, forever. Uh, so, um, oh, I've got some water, I've just had a strepsil, and uh, hopefully uh, I'm all prepped to get through an hour of uh, talking at you. Um, the one thing I'm, uh, I'll probably also make clear is that uh, my style and my advice is, is not to talk at so much as talk with. So I'll try and alleviate the burden of my, uh, my throat by, by getting you to contribute, although not quite as interactively uh, as, as Andrew did so well this morning. Um, you know, so I have a, a kind of plan. Um, I'm going over my slides. I more or less stick to the plan. It's, it's not the greatest ordered talk. Um, I can start off with a, with a one minute introduction. Um, probably that's, that, that could be all you need, um, <laughs> because I think my talk is, is probably going to um, really focus on what I, I seem to think of as stating the leading obvious. Um, but as I, I think I teach research methods better now than I taught research methods when I started, um, clearly I needed to find out the leading obvious at some point. I think I did it through trial and error, so it would have been nice if somebody told me, although in actual fact they probably did, I just didn't listen. Uh, I think that's the best way to find out is to, to work on it yourself, uh, maybe in a pair. Um, so, so, what is it that I'm going to talk about? Well, essentially I'm going to talk about teaching undergraduate research methods leading to quantitative methods. So I'm going to talk both about research design and quantitative methods because what I'm going to talk to you about is that I think they're linked and if you're able to link them um, in some constructive way, then I think that's a bonus for, for you and a bonus for the students, although obviously uh, it comes with uh, institutional constraints. Um, I, I watched all of the videos, actually, that you see put online, the first five minutes of all of the videos. Um, so I watched all of the introductions um, uh, that the people who have done these talks before made. Um, and I, I was really interested. I kind of agreed with everything they said, and I, I looked through the slides, and, and I think that there's some really sound advice uh, in this kind of library of information that, that, that Steve and a few others are not preparing. That's really good. So I, I, I used that as a kind of springboard um, for kind of what to talk to you about. And, um, I mean, I could talk to you about you know, how to structure sensibly teaching, but Paul Delson did it. Um, you know, there's uh, tips and tricks um, from Andrew this morning, and, and others have covered, covered it. So I, I went through all of the courses that I've taught that are quantitative methods, and I tried to find, well, what's, what do I do that, that works well? Right? Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, I, I seem to be doing a decent job in the sense that you know, no students have revolted as yet, um, despite the predictions when I started uh, in my first permanent position. Uh, if I did try and teach some qualitative methods, um, they, they seem to like the courses uh, in as far as you can gauge that and evaluations and, and talking to a very biased selection of students and only talk to you. Um, so I, I, I kind of looked through my uh, <coughs> of, of slides and sort of iron things, and it seems to me that, that the only thing that I really do that I can say it is, is a style, is I'm really, um, I repeat myself a lot, um, and I use a lot of examples so that the repetition isn't so repetitious. Um, and I think that works. And I, I also use a, a lot of variants in, in basically everything I do. So I try to use a lot of variants in how I structure the, the, the teaching. So obviously we're, we're often tied into lectures as the main delivery of information, um, so I try and add some variants to the lectures. Uh, but I've been lucky in the sense that I've also been able to add other forms of teaching uh, to run alongside that, and I think that's useful. Uh, I vary the assignments, um, I vary the use of data sets, um, and I get examples from essentially the, the breadth of my interests and knowledge, um, which are relatively limited. Um, I'm not very academic sometimes, um, but I think it kind of works. Um, so what I'll, I'll talk to you today is, um, I'm going to talk to you about an experience I had well, that lasted many, many years um, at the University of Sheffield, where I'm no longer based. Um, I think my replacement might even be sitting here. I think uh, a lot of the courses that I'll mention that, that I set up um, are now being taught by Al here, um, who will probably be able to tell you uh, in the Q&A session how he's improved them and they work much better now. Um, because uh, my view, um, from talking to Steve when, when Steve asked me to do this a few months ago, 
um, was that the thing that I could add is that none of the speakers up to that point um, had been from a British institution, although Andy Thiel uh, has since uh, talked in this series. He's from psychology, and psychology is different, um, in the way that economics is also different, uh, and some of the experiences that we have with the science and sociology um, are, um, are are unique to us, or at least they're, they're not the same as that. Um, and I found myself in the situation of setting up um, a series of quantitative methods, research methods, modules uh, in a department that had not um, happened before. Um, teaching them to um, a group of students that it was predicted would be very much resistant to learning quantitative methods. Um, and just from your introduction this morning, I know that, that some of you are either in or likely to be in that, that, that same boat. And as far as I can tell, um, that worked reasonably well, uh, at least eventually. Um, the modules that were established are still running. Um, they, they seem to have been reasonably successful. Maybe they've been fine tuned and improved uh, since I left. That's entirely the case. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about just the general themes that are my, my general approach, approach to teaching um, undergraduate research methods and undergraduate uh, quantitative methods in particular. Um, I think I have some, some themes running through, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be very useful to you, because I, I think one thing that, that really stands out from um, all the talks that are uh, taking place up to date is that everyone teaches to their own strengths and their own style, and by recognizing your style and your strength uh, and, and really working on what works well for you uh, is the way uh, that you're going to be a successful quantitative methods teacher. Um, even if you're teaching um, reluctant students, and, and you made that clear this morning, uh, hopefully you'll see that as an invitation for my, uh, my advice today. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I've used what I learned from setting up um, uh, undergraduate research methods and quantitative methods at, at Sheffield, an institution that didn't have them, uh, in which student body was relatively reluctant, and move them to a different context. Uh, a different country, uh, a different uh, department, a different body of students, um, a different structure altogether. Some things I think worked really well, some things just couldn't be transferred, um, and that could be the case just with different institutions in, in this country as well. Okay, so. Okay. If I have a theme in the way I teach, is that I do like a gimmick. Um, uh, I like a gimmick, I like to use lots of examples from political science, um, but I also like to use lots of examples from uh, having reviewed uh, my slides um, over the past uh, week or so. I realized that I use a lot of examples from football and a lot of examples from music, um, I use lots of references to, uh, to films, and the older I get, uh, the more and more out of touch with my students I realize I am. Uh, but, but nevertheless, so I thought, well, I might as well start with, uh, with a gimmick. Um, and the gimmick is, is the thing that I'm holding in my hand. I'm going to ask Sally if she can tell me in one word what she thinks this is. I didn't like that. I didn't like that answer at all. What do you think that is? Um, ah, that, that answer I liked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. It's a Bavaria, she says. It is a little Lego character. Um, I think that's good, it's a Bavarian, or at least a German, right? <laughs> How do you know he's a Bavarian? Uh, the, the outfit and the traditionalism to me brings a Bavarian. The label was in the hat, the carrying of pretzel, the size of his body. Um, okay. um, so, I think you could probably look at that, you recognise that that was kind of yeah, yeah, German, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You were being too literal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the most important thing was that it was Lego rather than you Korean, for example. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, it just so happens that we have a German in our midst today, <laughs> sitting right here, not from the back, but he's not from the back, he's on the other side of Germany. Does he look, does he look like this? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Obviously he's dressed professionally today, you know? <laughs> yeah, this is what he looks like, but we'll start, he's a little bit bigger, uh, he's not quite so angular, um, he, uh, he's not yellow, um, that's, that's for sure. But, you know, I think this is a, a pretty good likeness that I could instantly give that to you and you could, uh, you could recognize that as being a German or a Bavarian. At least you'd recognize that as a person. And, and the reason I kind of do this, you know, my 
first few minutes of my first class um, is because what this is is a model. Right? This is a model. Um, um, I've used other models, uh, you can use just about anything, I think. Um, I, I originally got the idea, I stole the idea, I took the idea um, from Gary King, who, who I think just drew a picture of the house and asked people what it was. Um, and so I tried to vary my model um, each time. Um, and then you, you, can, you can explain to the students, well, this is, this is a model. Um, they're engaged, um, just like you are in the room right now. Everyone seems to be smiling. They're all looking straight at me, uh, nobody shuffling or anything. You're thinking, where's it going with this? Um, so I have your attention. I had your attention right at the beginning of, of the talk. Um, whether I can keep that attention, that's, you know, that's another matter entirely. But I've got you from the start, then I have a fighting chance given for you to start talking about things you that's, don't like. That's your question, because if I were doing this, in one of the things I learned once was to start off right away. So I would have started by doing that shtick. And then I would have said, well, I want to tell you about blah, 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 blah. But you didn't do that. Like, do you think that was good? I mean, do you think that like my attitude is wrong? Like, I mean, because by, you did a more conventional thing, which might be better, which is you started by setting it up and saying what you're going to do, and then five minutes in, you started this. But I wonder, because I always think it's good to get people's attention, but the flip side is that if you start off right away, then people who are like not focusing might not realize what you're talking about. So do you think that your initial gave people a chance to warm up and get used to you? Is that the idea? It's, it's partly that. Um, how, I, how I normally like to start is, is like I like a research article to start. I, I, like, I like to present a puzzle. I want to say something like, um, there's something going on here. And wouldn't it be good if we could understand what was going on? And then I try and reveal that uh, as, the, as the lecture progresses. So it could be, uh, I have this theory, and I have, we have this hypothesis. How would we go about testing? Um, and then we might go uh, through some steps that will allow us to, uh, to test a particular thing. Um, it might be not slightly different because. So you might have an implicit assumption that our students turn up on time. <laughs> 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 I've spent the last three years uh, teaching in Germany, I have that assumption oh. it's, <laughs> it's reality. Um, but of course, the, the reason I, I talk about this uh, stuff is usually so that I can then relate it to political science, right? Then I can certainly start talking about my favorite model, um, which is, uh, for those who aren't political scientists, everyone else will of course know what it is, uh, it, it's usually called the funnel of causality, and you can use it to explain um, either the decision to vote or, or vote choice, uh, ways. Um, and the, the, the great thing about this model, I, I then go on to tell the students, is something I probably don't need to tell you, is that this model comes from the 1950s, it uses data from uh, that's 60 years old or so, um, from presidential uh, elections. Um, but I, I, I used this, I talked to my students two weeks ago, and I was able to relate this to, the, uh, to this Sunday's um, election in Germany, uh, and I can unpick this, this model, and I can get them to relate to the model as a way of understanding something in a completely different context. Uh, and then they can see the benefit of the model, because they'd already thought, well, okay, a, a Lego man doesn't look anything like an actual person, but I can see the benefit of uh, it being a representation of that. It's a, it's a gimmick, but it, it seems to be that's the way I start my lectures. Um, I, I start with a gimmick, I start with a puzzle. Um, and I, I try and then relate it to something, hopefully, that's relevant. Um, okay. So that's how I've started today. Not really relevant, though. So the, the rest of what say. When your students write, they write papers for your class, do you tell them to do that themselves? Do you say start your paper with a gimmick? No. <laughs> <laughs> I say start your paper with a puzzle. A puzzle. So you do, you do say that, that's the good they get to. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's not the only way. Uh, of, of, of starting an empirical paper, but it is the way I prefer. Um, and, and I think a lot of the papers I enjoy reading the most start with a puzzle that really piques my interest uh, and one that I want to, to see interacts. So, um, so there's a little bit about you know what happened at, at, at Sheffield and, and the, the course that was set up there, um, and. Uh, the, what the motivation for, for starting these courses, and then I'll start telling you about how it might be different or how um, it might have worked well uh, and maybe also not as well. 
Um, but the idea was that we wanted some basic quantitative methods for all undergraduates that were coming through uh, the political side of politics department um, at the University of Sheffield. Um, there hadn't been a quantitative model, methods model there uh, when I arrived. Um, but also, uh, we wanted there to be a point to that. Right? If they're going to learn a basic quantitative methods, there ought to be an opportunity for them to go on and learn more advanced quantitative methods. Um, you know, this, this is perhaps all relative. Uh, maybe when you transfer uh, the most basic and advanced to Columbia, the description might be slightly different, uh, but it might hold uh, some of the institutions from the UK. Um, and we also wanted to somehow link the learning of quantitative methods to something they can use externally to just producing research. Right? And it seemed like the most obvious way was to link it to skills they could then use and, and uh, used in a way that, that could be profitable then, for them, um, i.e. by getting a job or by going into a postgraduate career. Um, but also uh, to link it to what they already understand about how the political world works. Right? So to be able to, to, to learn about quantitative methods and realize that that's going to make them a better consumer of, of political information, whether it be from the media, from political parties, as well as uh, reading political science papers. Courses. So this is our overall aim. And how did we um, yeah. how did we start off? Well, first off, we started off with what we thought was going to be uh, the, the major problem was the resistance amongst the students. Um, I was told before I took the position um, that I'm going to cause a revolution if I try and teach this student body quantitative methods. There's going to be a revolution. Okay. Um, People said something along these lines. Um, students are very anxious about learning statistics, right? They, they haven't had a great deal of mathematics training. Uh, they've left it behind a few years. Uh, most social science um, students in the UK uh, probably haven't had um, any maths training since their GCSE, so they have at least a two-year uh, gap where they've had uh, no mathematics. Um, there could be uh, a denial, right? Um, a denial that um, that statistics has any relevance or any place in our understanding of politics. Um, this is, of course, uh, also something that some of our colleagues uh, also share. And of course, there's also the ignorance uh, that a student might come uh, to political science with uh, how we actually use statistics in order to evaluate evidence uh, and whether we actually do so. So what solutions do we use? Well, one is, is to be subject specific. Um, and I, I think you know, most of our political science departments are large enough that we're probably going to teach the research methods. Um, all, all political scientists together are taught by political scientists. Um, but I kind of extended that. And I wanted to teach them research methods and quantitative methods, not just subject specific, but also sub-discipline specific to a certain degree, so that if somebody is interested uh, in international relations, say, they can still un uh, understand and relate to a lot of the methods we learn, and it's not just going to be um, lots of examples from public opinion or voting behavior or something else. Uh, which means I had to you know, go out of my comfort zone of those two areas uh, and teach a little bit about um, international relations and comparative politics more broadly, British politics, American politics, um, so that I could uh, generate interest amongst all of the kind of subgroups uh, of interest amongst the student body. Um, we tried to link the course with the real world, uh, as I've called it here, um, and we did that in, in a number of ways. So one is that we tried to expose them to a lot of data and a lot of uh, uh, statistics um, from non-political science sources. Um, but another way was we also tried to generate um, uh, some, some interest in careers that might then use quantitative <coughs> methods. And um, very helpfully, we managed to get an ELC, ESLC grant um, to, to improve some of the things we did at Sheffield. And one of the things we did was we invited some speakers with what we thought were cool and interesting jobs. Um, that were relevant to politics students, but used quantitative methods uh, in their daily work. So we had people from the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit come and talk to our students. We had somebody uh, from the Ministry of Justice come and talk to our students. Um, we had somebody from Ipsos Mori uh, come and talk to the students uh, about what they do and how they use quantitative methods. And these were extremely well received. The students enjoyed these talks uh, a lot, uh, and I'm under the impression that this is carried on uh, where possible uh, to this day. 
Um, we tended to stress application and interpretation over an understanding of formulae. Um, I'll get to this at the end. I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, the, the best strategy. Um, I, I actually think maybe uh, teaching even undergraduate students the formulae uh, and, and relevant um, derivations even um, uh, of various methods that we use uh, is, is important, but usually we're under some sort of time constraint. Um, and, and this is this is not possible. It wasn't possible at Sheffield, uh, but it, it is at Mannheim. I'll think about that later. Um, and variation, as I mentioned, um, lots of variation in everything I do, uh, so that people have hopefully less opportunity to get bored. Um, and another thing that's I, I think a really big deal, and it's something we don't talk about very much, uh, usually because we're, we're very much constrained by departmental regulations or departmental practice is that time is really important. The more time you have for the students, the better their experience will be. If you just have your students um, for one hour a week, um, for six weeks, or even 12 weeks, uh, it's not nearly going to be as profitable an experience if you have them for double that time or longer. Um, and and we, we had a benefit at Sheffield of being able to teach a course uh, over the entire academic year. So we had them uh, for, for two semesters, which was Four weeks or so, um, all in the lecture in every single week. Uh, we did have managed uh, to have more time with them than we would have done for the regular one semester course. What do our courses look like? Um, well, we had one course which was compulsory for everyone. Um, it taught over the course of the academic year research design, um, the ubiquity of numbers in politics, in political arguments. Um, in, um, Used by the media parties, interest groups, etc. And then we talk them about quantitative methods. Um, the idea behind this, I guess, is that firstly, we want to place quantitative methods in a context. And of course, the context is um, that it's uh, a process towards the end of, uh, of a research project, uh, and a research project should begin with some sort of design. Right? So uh, we teach them about you know, how to develop. Um, you know, good research questions, how to think about uh, interesting questions, um, how to think about theories, how to uh, develop hypotheses from these theories, um, so that by the time uh, they've thought long and hard about what they're interested in, um, they're almost begging us for tools for analyzing um, these hypotheses that we've developed, or at least that is the plan. Um, and in the same way, uh, we've also Im impressed upon them just how important it is to understand quantification because it is everywhere in political life. Um, it's, uh, you know, we have exercises in seminars uh, in which we ask students um, to bring excerpts from uh, newspapers in which numbers have been used um, in, uh, in an article on a particular day of the week. Students have no problem finding um, the use of numbers, statistics, data in newspaper articles, uh, and then we can have a critique of those numbers. Sometimes they use very sensibly, very often um, they use completely out of context or without enough uh, information to really understand and justify the conclusions that they make, and of course that would apply to anybody else, any other uh, group that uses, um, that uses numbers to try and make the case. Um, and then also we had an optional um, dissertation in quantitative methods of the third year um, that, uh, that actually um, taught students through a kind of workshop-based system some more advanced methods than what we taught in the compulsory module try and generate um, you know, interest uh, amongst those who are really keen, who have really enjoyed, I guess, the, the second year course. We'll see, we're not talking about huge numbers here. Uh, we're aiming for about four to eight people, and we got about four to eight people. Okay. So, if I put it on the that slide, um, the, um, the dissertation in um, this session of political science, is that what we called it? Is that what it's called now? I can't remember what it's called. Uh, the quantitative dissertation in politics, maybe it's called. Um, I'm not sure if I've got that title right. But the idea was that if a student wanted to do uh, a undergraduate thesis that involved uh, the use of quantitative information to answer a research question, we made the resources available to them so that they could do that. Um, we taught them in workshops. Um, various aspects of data collection, data analysis, that are student-led. Right? If they want to, uh, to learn logistic regression, 
then uh, we would teach them just do regression, time series analysis, or perhaps just uh, just linear regression or horizontal stations, for example. Um, and it involved many workshops that uh, enable the students to present their ongoing work um, and, um, and to, to comment on the work of others uh, and, and get feedback, regular feedback um, from their peers and from the tutors. Um, but also it was embedded in the existing system so that we would have a dual supervision system so that there would be a, a quantitative supervisor but also a substantive supervisor. So uh, if the method size was being um, supervised by me but the, the topic, the research question was in international relations, then they would have a, um, a primary supervisor um, from a substantive area. So. We didn't think we'd have much success in convincing students um, to go down this, this road, especially a road that had not been travelled before, so we offered some incentives. Um, and despite advertising some quite significant uh, monetary prizes, um, we still have relatively small numbers. Um, you see here the absolute number and <coughs> percentage um, of the cohort. Uh, the first year we offered it, uh, we had four takers, second year eight takers. Uh, by this time the ESRC money had run out and there was no prize advertised the next year. Uh, very helpfully, the department actually awarded a prize uh, with a monetary um, with a monetary prize attached to it. Uh, but the students didn't know that when they signed up, uh, and we still had seven uh, in that year, which means that we're not really sure that, that incentive was necessary. If you were interested in going that tra down that track, uh, it probably wasn't the possibility uh, of winning a prize at the end of it. Um, and I have been informed this week uh, that there is now in place uh, a prize that's sponsored by uh, the polling company UCO. Sorry, could I just, what do you mean by a prize? As in all students who did it no, got no, no right? The student, the student who gets the best mark amongst, okay. amongst those that are doing a quantitative okay. dissertation. So, um, there were some other um, pilots um, that, that ran at the same time as this that was funded by, were funded by the ESRC that also used monetary incentives uh, for people to, uh, to take the, the quantitative um, modules and to, to enact quantitative research. Uh, for their theses. Uh, and I think they found similar things in the sense that um, uh, they were still getting small numbers. Even being paid, uh, paid to learn and paid to use um, quantitative methods in their thesis uh, it didn't excite um, large numbers of students to do it for instrumental monetary That's reward. a good thing, right? Because rationally speaking, 100 pounds is a small amount compared to the value of their education. So if they were responding to that, that would be a bad sign. Did students do better? I can't possibly say. <laughs> the numbers are far too small. Um, but uh, but you know we like we like data and we like numbers. Um, so let's compare these ridiculously small numbers uh, to rather larger numbers. And we actually saw in the first year there was almost no difference between those who took a regular dissertation and those who took a quantitative dissertation. Um, in the next year, uh, the mean uh, was slightly higher, so over three percentage points. But when we're talking about compared to a couple of hundred students. You, you also uh, have the exhausted. issue that it might be that, because it's seen as harder, it might be the better students who are going on to do the point things anyway. Well, that's all you have, right? Um, so maybe another way of looking at it is, do students improve more? Mm -hmm. right? So rather than um, just looking at the absolute numbers, where you have selection bias, um, do they improve more? So in the first year, on average, uh, compared to all of the work they do in that third year, um, all students, or on average, students do better in, in the, the dissertation, uh, 1.4 percentage points. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the quantitative students did um, a little bit better still, 2.4 percentage points. Um, in the second year, um, all students did better still, but the uh, quantitative students did uh, much better right, compared to the, the, the rest of their work at that level. Right? Again, you can't really make very much uh, out of that, as you can see, the, 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 the girls who won the prizes um, improved, you know, from their average body of work by 10 percentage points to almost 20 percentage points. Quite clearly, they're, they're trying to use big improvements. Um, something that um, I, I only thought about you know, in the last couple of days is that um, the, the, this was the, this prize was won by a female 
this prize was won by a female. The one after, the prize after that was won by a female. And then I left Sheffield. Uh, but uh, looking around their website this week, uh, the person who won the UGOV prize um, in, in the year that's just passed was also female. So I, uh, I don't know what to make of that, just that that's interesting. And, and probably coincidence. Um, but uh, maybe one day a man will break through that glass ceiling and uh, will take the object of the station. Um, there's, a, there's another issue, right? I mean, in order to actually run and to run some analysis at the undergraduate level, you, s you already need to have done some sort of other work already. And that is, by definition, going to be much higher. Than it. You know, so it's not really comparable with the two marks in the sense that you already uh, give some extra points and extra marks because of the whole work that has been done there. It doesn't really affect the same quality of work that has been done. Uh, between the you know, kind of theoretical and the non theoretical uh, sort of, uh, empirical dissertation. At least, from my own experience, I would say that they always tend to get higher marks precisely because there's a lot of work that has been done until the point that they get to analyze the data. Well, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Um, so, I mean, I'm not really saying anything, except I have some data. The data is unreliable. It points in one direction. It may be the other direction. Um, I think you're probably right. Uh, the enthusiasm shown by the, the students, the self-selecting students in the quantitative track of the dissertation, um, was of a, of a marked difference to the other students that I interacted with that, that were doing standard track, which is essentially just a you know, 8,000, 10,000 word uh, extended essay. Um, Always have uh, sort of a purpose you might like to see in that class of the long piece of work. So, of course, we have drawbacks here. Firstly, um, we were very lucky at Sheffield because we had um, we had a lot of departmental willingness for these modules to succeed. Right? Now, a lot of people didn't think they would they would succeed, and maybe people even think that they didn't succeed. Um, but um, I think it was relatively well appreciated. Um, the evaluations of the course uh, seem to be pretty good, and, and, and I hear that they still are. Um, you know, the department <coughs> supported us when we, uh, when we wanted more money to improve our quantitative methods teaching through the ESRC, and they backed us, and, and that isn't always the case. So that's a potential drawback, maybe, uh, for you. Um, also, you may not have as much flexibility as you'd like in, in the terms of um, you know, can you can you vary the assessment? Can you vary the length of the course? Can you make it appropriate? What does it have to fit in very rigid boundaries of how many departments set up? Uh, and also, it takes a lot of resources, right? Um, you know, it takes a village to raise a political scientist, uh, a good one anyway. Um, just one person in the department doing uh, doing all this on their own is is quite is quite difficult. Um, uh, I think the, the more people uh, that you can get to aid in the quantitative methods, uh, the better the situation is going to be, especially if you can embed a lot of those methods in the substantive courses uh, and generate uh, more interest in that way. Um, but, and I think these, these things were pointed out in other talks that you can, uh, you can download from the web, um, you do actually provide a service to every other colleague. So every other colleague, colleague should thank you uh, for uh, making, uh, your, making their students better able to read the literature in their class, better able to, uh, to come to term papers uh, with you know, research questions and hypotheses and maybe even the ability to analyze data. Um, we can ably demonstrate that it prepares them for a number of careers, certainly prepares them better for uh, postgraduate careers than otherwise. And as many people have been talking about in the, the coffee break and at lunch, there's money to be had here, right? Um, we know there's a skills shortage among social scientists um, of quantitative methods, and institutions like Northfield and Kefke and the SLC are aware of the skills shortage, and they're putting money um, where that shortage lies. Um, and some of the people in this room are in departments that were successful and some unsuccessful, and this seems to be the big talking point of the week here in, in the UK. Okay. So. Is data really ubiquitous? Do you see it everywhere? I think it's, when I'm talking to the kind of 18, 19 year old undergraduates, I don't think they're quite buying it, right? When I tell them 
You're faced with statistics every day. Um, you're faced with data every day. Um, and, and I don't think they quite buy it. But then you can show them, you know, wh whatever you're interested in, right? Okay, I teach German students now, so I like to let them know, look, you've got, you've got the normal distribution on your old money, right? And, uh, and, uh, and a lovely picture of, of Gauss. Um, Hollywood are making movies starring Brad Pitt about somebody who utilized statistics to change a particular sport. Right? This is uh, based on Michael Lewis's uh, best-selling book about um, how um, Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, have I got that right? Thank you. Baseball man. Um, how he transformed the way uh, people who run baseball look at baseball players. Um, right? Uh, it's, it's a fun film. Have you seen it? Um, this rather com complicated looking infographic is actually a concert review from the New York Times. Right? There's, a, there's a band, actually it's just a guy, it goes by a, a, a name that makes it sound like a band uh, called Bright Eyes, it's a series of shows in, in New York City, uh, and they decided a fun way of evaluating the show would be to create all this data and make some pretty pictures out of the data. Um, and even uh, we can find out you know, what, we're, what we're doing whilst we're watching football matches. Um, apparently, we're tweeting when goals are scored. Mm -hmm. uh, who'd have thought? Um, and this is another example that, uh, that resonates pretty well with my current students. Um, my apologies to Elias uh, for not mm -hmm. that game. Um, and I can't play the clip because, um, of course, we don't have a license and I wouldn't think about it. Uh, there's even a chance that's some things in the book of love, uh, which is a great song for me to so, as I mentioned before, um, if I have, uh, if I have uh, uh, one piece of advice to what I think works well um, when I teach quantitative methods, it's this. It, it's to, to bury everything. Um, bury everything so that there's always going to be something of interest to some people. But also to look beyond your comfortable horizons of, um, okay, I, I, I teach British voting behavior, I'm going to do it. Uh, a 12, 14 week course um, on, on research methods that uses all the examples and really well um, from voting behavior. That's going to be fantastic to some students, right? That's going to be perfect. Um, but it's going to alienate some other students who see uh, this course as, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not interested in voting behavior. I'm interested in some other, uh, other aspect of political science. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to give you some examples of my examples. Um, but uh, very often I like to show examples that get people thinking, um, right? And usually it doesn't take uh, very long for somebody to see a graph uh, about um, competitiveness of an election, turn out, uh, to look at a, uh, a regression line, to see the countries. These are usually the best graphs, by the way, scatterplot but list, but list geographical places. Students love this for, for obvious reasons. They like to, play, they just like to find their state, or their country and how it compares to other countries they have an interest in. Uh, and here, you know, why might Australia and Belgium be an outlier in that particular distribution? Um, students will think about that, right? If students know a little bit um, about those countries, um, then they might have an idea that those two countries are outliers, perhaps because of uh, the policy votes. From politics. Um, if I can, I like to get examples from political discourse that I think aid in understanding. This one, for example. Um, I was debating with somebody the other day whether or not this was the most famous headline um, from a British newspaper of all time. They said, well, it's probably gotcha um, um, from the sun, and they were probably right. But this is up there. Right? This, is, this is a newspaper headline that a lot of people remember. And when I talk about hypotheses um, in, in my research design class, um, I show them this newspaper and I say, well, is there a hypothesis being generated here? Has the Sun come up with a hypothesis? And I think it has, right? The Sun newspaper, the best-selling newspaper at the time, uh, is saying that uh, they're influential enough so that their, head, their headline, their, their, their coverage of the election from the day before the 1992 uh, general election was significant enough in influencing people um, in order uh, to actually change the result of the election. That's a long winded hypothesis, but there's a better hypothesis in there, right, about media effects uh, and elections. And of course, it's one um, that uh, people, a lot of people, uh, will know in this room. 
was actually tested uh, by political cell agents. Um, this guy, um, who it turns out that most of my German students don't know, um, <laughs> so it doesn't work nearly as well. Okay. In Germany, as it worked in the UK, and it would work in the US, um, was pretty well known a few years ago um, outside of the US, still is well known inside the US, um, but he doesn't get the sort of coverage uh, he used to. Uh, it was, of course, James Carville who uh, effectively ran uh, Clinton's campaign. What hypothesis could we get from, from James Carville? Well, he's, he's pretty well known uh, for the phrase, it's the economy stupid. Um, now, it, it's not a great leap of the imagination to move that to what he actually meant was, right, if you want to win an election uh, in a time of uh, economic uh, recession, then as the non-incumbent, you want to bring every conversation, you want to bring every instance of campaigning round to discussion about the economy. Right? It's a hypothesis you could test. You know, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of articles about economic voting that test the hypothesis very simply based on that. Maybe that, that's helpful. Um, uh, I find the students often struggle um, with differentiating between um, theories and concepts and hypotheses. Uh, okay. um, the way that statistics is taught is not help because we <laughs> term hypothesis has two meanings. <coughs> Sorry. One meaning is a hypothesis is something that you might believe and study the up. The other meaning is a hypothesis is something that you do not believe and want to reject. So the term hypothesis in a statistics class, I mean, I think, you know, it actually misleads actual practitioners. It's not just their fault. Yeah. I mean, this is from my research design class. Um, but it'd be very difficult to avoid using the term hypothesis. Um, you know, given the readings thing. No, I, I don't mind the term hypothesis. I, I think that the use of the term hypothesis in the so-called hypothesis testing, I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's not as useful when people say the hypothesis is that this is zero and we're rejecting that. I mean, that's not a very useful use of the term hypothesis because it's not really a hypothesis. That's but anyway, but anyway you know, I went through my uh, uh, my slides over the past few days, and I realized that I use a lot of references uh, to pop culture. Um, in some senses, uh, I like it because um, it engages students in a way that they, they think, well, okay, that's that's something I'm definitely interested in, in football, music, film, whatever. Um, you know, how can quantitative methods be applied there? Um, but also, sometimes you can get much better examples, right? So if you if you want to look at a, um, differences between measures of central tendency, um, um, you know, just how different they can be, um, you, know, you can probably find nothing quite so uh, quite so differential as some sports team salaries. Um, usually, I kind of play a game with my students, and uh, I actually show them uh, the distribution of this particular team, um, and I ask them, you know, what team it could possibly be. What team, what sports team could possibly have um, some, somebody earning uh, this little amount of money, uh, but the mean to be so high, you know, driven by obviously some player or some players earning a, a lot. Um, usually I get some fantastic uh, guesses. It's rare that they actually realize it's the LA Galaxy or uh, the New York Red Bulls, I think is the actual example we used this year. It's account, they've been since, uh, since retired. Um, this is one that also seems to engage um, my students. Um, I, I use it as an aspect of, uh, of research design too. Can anybody identify the link between those six people? 27. 27. <laughs> okay, 27. What about 27? They all die at the age of 27. They did all die at the age of 27. Um, so, so each of these pop stars, pop stars uh, died at the age of 27. Amy Winehouse relatively recently. Um, what's interesting, perhaps, an interesting research question that that might generate in you is, is it a, ris is it a risky business uh, being, being a pop star, being a rock star? How would you test that? If you wanted to test that, what sort of sample frame would you use in order to um, test whether or not being a pop star is, is more risky than not being a pop star? Right? If you think about it, well, 
suddenly becomes quite hard, but of course some researchers have already done this, um, and they use a sample frame based on, if I remember rightly, um, they looked at all of the albums on uh, the Rolling Stone, thousand best albums of the 20th century, I think. Um, they, they looked at everybody uh, who was involved in all of those uh, albums, um, they only counted people once, uh, they looked at what their age they were, and they saw the average age for first becoming a rock star, defined by being on this list, was 25, and then they looked at how many uh, of those had died within five years of becoming uh, a rock star, and then they compared that to the uh, general population, and then they compared that uh, to people serving in Iraq and then Afghanistan, and realized that actually it's much riskier uh, to be a pop star than it is to be uh, a soldier serving in the forces. Um, I use this to make a point about sample frames, not causality. Um, uh, or what called confound effects or, or anything else. Um, but it kind of does, uh, does engage them uh, in a way that just talking about sample frames from uh, electoral rolls kind of or telephone numbers doesn't quite get their attention. Um, Andrew made a point this morning um, that, that, that is completely right. Students like to have information about themselves. And they like to talk about themselves, they like to have themselves talked about, so um, I, I think I probably came to this conclusion a little bit late, um, but I did realize uh, over the past year that this is undoubtedly the case. Um, um, what I use here is just to show them uh, the difference in means for uh, people who got the five optional credit points for attending um, non-mandatory tutorials that ran alongside my research sign course versus the mean of uh, those who did not. Okay? And I showed them this um, at the beginning of the class and said, look, last year's cohort, you got five extra credit points, but you're actually worth 20 uh, percentage points in the exam at the end. Again, I don't talk about causality uh, here. Uh, I, I, just, uh, I just showed them this as a way of presenting uh, the measures of central tendency. Um, uh, and actually, they, they like that to the extent that in the summer exam um, in June, um, I, I invigilate my exams, I proctor my exams um, at, at Mannheim. Um, it isn't the most interesting job in the world. It's a very quiet room, you're there for an hour and a half. There's not a great deal to do, but you need to have your attention. Uh, so this year, um, I decided, well, what else am I going to do? I'll collect data on my students. Um, uh, they all have assigned seatings. I, I can match the names of the students. Eventually, I'll know the, the, the score they got. So I collected data on left-handedness, right-handedness. Collected data on who was drinking water, who was drinking uh, non-water drinks, especially cola, um, and who wasn't drinking anything, um, who had an English German dictionary and who didn't, um, and, uh, and then I brought it back to my office and I thought, one day I'll find the time to enter that into the spreadsheet, um, but I haven't found that time just yet, but I realise it could be quite useful. I think the students would enjoy uh, that sort of information. Um, this was another one that, that I also found quite interesting because um, um, I, I told them I was going to show them a, a graph of the distribution of their grades in the previous semester's exam based on, before I showed them this, uh, the length of their names. And I asked them whether they thought it was an impositively related, negative re negatively related, and if so, why? And they got, that's really, really interesting. Uh, um, Hypotheses put forward. Um, well, um, a long name is uh, is probably a function of, of um, being more aristocratic in the German uh, system, or having a double-barrel name. It's more middle class. Um, somebody else said, "Well, it tends to be that uh, non-German students tend to have longer names, and uh, we know that non-German systems don't non-German students don't tend to perform as well. So actually, maybe it's going to be negative. Uh, and in the end, of course." Um, all I wanted to show them was what a flat line in a regression looks like. Because it's, there's no correlation, really might be a correlation. Um, but it, 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 it did prompt an interesting debate um, about people, I guess, inductively seeing some data and trying to, or being told about some data and trying to get it back into it even before um, they saw it. We, we sometimes do this thing called scatter plot charades, where we <laughs> show them the scatter plot, but of course, just the points without the axes and then the axes. Yeah, I, 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 I see some textbooks like that too. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we use that as 
Okay. So variation in examples. Variation also in activities. I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, uh, we try and uh, we try to run at Sheffield uh, a number of activities in seminars that run alongside the lecture series. Um, what you could do is like many seminars, is you kind of go over the readings um, and you go over the same material as the lectures. That's not going to be effective in a research design class or a uh, quantitative methods class. Um, but um, other aspects of dealing with quantitative information have been effective, I think. So one thing that we do is um, we get them to, to, to have a debate. So we give them some data on something, right? Crime, immigration, um, European integration. Something that we think they might be interested in, but they wouldn't have a lot of facts at their, at their disposal. And then we divide uh, the seminar group into essentially two teams, and we give them a selection uh, of, of tables. Right? And then they can use those tables, and only the information from those tables, to try and form an argument um, for uh, two um, opposite points of view. They don't get to decide which point of view they get to argue, um, they, uh, uh, they're assigned a group. Um, and often they get more than just two, two tables, they get uh, some graphs and some tables, um, some of which can be quite clearly argued uh, for or against a particular proposition. And, and what the eventual outcome of this is, is well, at first they're unsure how to deal with this, how to read the tables, but by the end of the session they're nearly always uh, acting the exact same way. I want more data, give me more data. I want to make this argument, but you haven't given me the data to make this argument. Right? So you've got them, initially reluctant, uh, begging for more data, for more facts, more evidence. Um, and uh, I think this is, this is kind of what we want, right? We, we, want, to, uh, we want them uh, to have that sort of attitude. Okay. Um, we also spend um, quite a bit of time, um, we did this at Sheffield, maybe they still do, um, and, uh, and we do this at Mannheim, uh, and these sessions seem to go really well, at least when I've sat in on these sessions, is that we give the students some relatively complicated tables and graphs um, taken somewhat out of context from publications, from, from books and from, and from articles, uh, and we may summarize them in a couple of sentences, um, we may give them some information, but then we <coughs> ask them to interpret them. And on the face of it, it seems like, uh, well, what sort of exercise is that? You're, uh, you know, there's a 400-page there's a book around this, this table, this graph, or there's a 20-page article uh, that's going to explain Make conclusions, but what you tend to find is that just on the table or the graph alone, uh, you know, intelligent students can interpret what's going on, even when the data uh, and the data gathering process are extremely complex. Um, and we think that that instills a sort of confidence in them um, that uh, they can um, they can interpret uh, data, uh, or at least they can have discussions uh, with their with their cohort that allows them to uncover. Uh, perhaps all the motivations and therefore all the conclusions uh, of you know, a very complicated research could be. This is just, just an example of the many we offer them. Um, I almost, just almost, put something from, uh, from one of Andrew's, from Andy's book. And I, I realized, uh, you know, that looks familiar, I'll then just check, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't think it was page 43, but um, uh, it isn't the only thing I need to know about. Um, okay. Variation in assessment. Um, I, I think we were lucky, in a sense, on, on that course, um, that we had a lot of assessment. Um, I think it worked uh, really well. I'm not sure the students liked that aspect of the course uh, too well. We had a lot of short assignments, um, and uh, we thought that was, that was really good. Uh, it allowed the students um, uh, to be doing work kind of early, uh, and you know, the best way of forcing somebody to learn something uh, is to have them test. <coughs> Uh, about it, um, but I think we can probably conclude that the students would prefer it if they just have one essay or exam at the end of the semester uh, than to have uh, three pieces of, of work and then an exam. Um, but we think the actual learning um, uh, effects of having multiple assessment was really, really useful. Um, uh, Alvin maybe talk about how they've changed it now, but he did mention earlier uh, that they've removed the exam component this course, so that it's now all coursework, uh, which previously used to be, I can't remember the distribution is, but there are three items of coursework and one exam. Um, we have a, a questionnaire design group assignment um, that essentially forces the students uh, to think about placing a, you know, a 
procedure for, for gathering data uh, within a sensible research design. Um, it's done in groups just to make the assignment more manageable at the beginning of the semester. Um, we do something similar at Mannheim, um, but we, uh, we only offer extra credit, you know, 5 or 20 percentage points of extra credit, depending on how you want to do it. We have another assignment uh, that uh, asks people to compare um, different political organizations' use of statistics, uh, usually on the same issue and two related organizations. So perhaps how two political parties, for example, deal with um, data on immigration, or um, how do uh, two interest groups, um, you know, particularly uh, the policy area, let's say maybe uh, abortion or abortion reform, uh, deal with statistics, right? and if they can uh, compare those organisations and the way they use statistics, it gets them to uh, to really interface with um, uh, the way um, political actors engage with, with data, um, with sometimes huge barriers. Um, and then, of course, we actually give them um, some data analysis assignment. Right? We give them some data, uh, we teach them, well, we show them how to use a, a piece of software, uh, we give them some real data, we give them a choice of real data. Um, uh, the, the, the time I was at Sheffield, uh, we gave them um, something from voting behavior, um, something from political sociology, something from comparative politics, and something from where IR and comparative politics meets, um, we slightly cleaned up those data sets. Um, this is quite time intensive, at least in the beginning. Um, we placed at least the, the, the top three we were able to. Uh, we placed those, those clean, tidy data sets uh, with you know, meaningful variable names, labels, nice, easy to read code books in the data archive at the University of Essex. Um, I think they're all from 2005, so maybe they're slightly dated now, uh, but at least that's a resource that's available to other people. Um, and I think more and more teaching data sets have been placed uh, in the ESDS that's been out of Manchester Essex, I'm not quite sure. Um, and so students are able to do an assignment using real data, and hopefully real data from whichever subgroup of uh, sub-discipline of uh, business science they're interested in. We offered a lot of support. Um, this is where you need resources and uh, people. We used SVSS at Sheffield. Um, it wouldn't have been my, my first preference, um, although I think it worked just fine um, for, for how we're using it. Uh, Mannheim, we use SATA. Um, R would be good too, um, uh, as a possibility. Um, we had a series of, of workshops um, that the students all had to attend. Uh, we produced some how to guides, um, in addition, obviously, to, to relevant readings. Um, we had a pre asked questions board, uh, and we had a, a message forum on the virtual learning environment. We also had drop-in surgeries where people could come in with any, uh, any questions, special sessions for using um, different data sets, and uh, a, a seminar just on how to interpret SPSS data. Going on a bit Um, uh, 
uh, but something that seems to work well uh, in the mainline context. I still can't see it work in the British context, but maybe, maybe it's a possibility. Some general tips. Um, so there's no way around the fact that um, if we want to teach 200 students quantitative methods, um, then most of the teaching is going to revolve around the kind of lecture format, where once you can add in some interaction, most of it's going to be uh, a kind of one-way delivery of information. So I, what I try to do at the moment I teach for 90 minutes is I try to build in lots of breaks in a way that perhaps I, I haven't done here today, uh, just when people look at it flagging a bit. Um, uh, I try to build in breaks, I mean I don't, I don't really organize this, but um, I like to at least every 20 minutes to just kind of <coughs> slow down, walk amongst the students a little bit, kind of a la Jerry, Jerry Sign, no, no, Jerry Springer, is that right? There's a big difference between those two guys. Uh, and, and just show them something and start asking them questions about it, um, right, with the purpose of, you know, you know how, much, how much can you conclude from being presented with, with an AP study? Uh, and you know, seeing as we're here in Oxford, this is something that I use. Well, I think I use it when I talk about uh, correlation does not equal causation, but I, I think I come back to it when we start talking about problems with using time series data. Um, apologies to David Hendry, this is not the actual graph. Uh, if I just actually took the graph uh, from, from his uh, article, um, it would just provide too much effort in getting rid of the, um, the axes and its black and white. Interesting, so it's one. Um, and I get, I get students to, to tell me uh, what they think uh, might be so closely related to uh, inflation. And I get some, some great answers, right? Some great sensible answers. And, and I guess everybody will know here this is, of course, cumulative rainfall, um, right? It's, uh, well, I'm fairly sure it's a spurious uh, relationship. It's a time series. Be enthusiastic. I guess that's, that's got nothing to do with quantitative methods, but maybe it's, it, it's advice uh, that's more relevant to quantitative methods if you're teaching students uh, who, are, who are somewhat resistant. Um, I don't think there's any replacement for just being really enthusiastic about what you about what you teach and how you teach it. Right? That's why I kind of um, often deviate towards um, things that you know I'm really passionate about, like football, um, uh, because. Um, you know, I like to be enthusiastic, and you can see it. You can see it in front of you uh, with the students. When you're enthusiastic, you can actually see uh, how much more interested and motivated that uh, becomes. So sometimes, I, you know, I'll, I'll present some. Oh, let's get the rest of this data series up here. I love this graph. I update it every year. I've been using it in my lectures for years. Um, I absolutely love this graph. This is actually an all voters. It's not um, uh, not all voters who said they would vote. If you want to look at the details, Steve. Um, but this is just, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it for an hour, but you could, right? If you're interested in British politics, you know, you might just be introducing, you know, a way of, uh, a way of presenting information, but you've got the 20 years of history, of uh, British political history right here, right? You can get really excited talking about, um, I know, the, the, the fall of uh, Thatcher, rise of Major, the ERM crisis, uh, death of John Smith, the... Uh, coming to power of Tony Blair, New Labour, petrol crisis, um, what else, David Cameron, uh, Nick Clegg debate effect, and the uh, you know, coalition starting to struggle, but uh, you know, have updated this since February. Um, but you, know, you literally could, and I do get very enthusiastic about this. Um, and, uh, I think it's worth remembering, going back to that job, when, uh, when a lot of our students are born, for us, we lived it, but many people in the room don't actually fall on until the sort of third or fourth year into that chart. Yeah, I, I, I realize very much now that um, <laughs> whenever I started doing this, every time I added a year of data, I should have deleted a year of data from the beginning, <laughs> right? And it would have had the same effect that it had the first time uh, I did that. Uh, but another reason, like, I kind of said, well, you know, think, think broad when you're using uh, examples. Um, but also, if you're really enthusiastic about something you're working on right now, um, then you know, that might be something you want to use uh, in your lecture as well, because you, you're, never, you're never more enthusiastic about anything than when you're working on it and you think you've discovered something or you think you've got something interesting uh, and it's not published yet, you're not weary of it, uh, and so you might just uh, 
show it to your students uh, and they'll be able to gauge your enthusiasm about it. Uh, it doesn't really matter what this you know, is, but... Just, just, sorry, but you might me something here. When I give talks like to academic audience and not for my class, I found that it always works, it usually works better if I present stuff that I've already published that's not fresh. Like when I talk about the most exciting stuff I'm doing now, it doesn't go as well because I don't have as clear a story. And I feel like even like academic audiences, like people you respect and all that, they will prefer a very clean story of something already published. Or you talk to them about work in progress and, and if they don't, I don't know, that's my experience. That, that kind of depends though because if his work in progress, then it's actually more exciting to have a conversation about it. Well, that's what you would think, although my experience has been when I've talked about, when I've given talks, it seems to work better if I pulled off a little bit. So I'm just sharing that experience. I'm not saying it's always true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I make the, the same observation. Um, when, when people come to give research talks, they just usually not in it. Um, those already published, well developed research talks seem to be better appreciated than the this is something I'm working on, I'm quite excited about, but it's not completely uh, thought through. Uh, and then it, it tends to generate into halfway through the, uh, the presentation. People have got too many questions, the answers are uh, not satisfactory, and, and the presentation is <laughs> So I think you're right there, but um, also if you're trying to get enthusiasm across to your, your students, maybe this is one way, um, you can always guarantee that when you're in the middle of a project, you can have that enthusiasm. Um, yeah, occasionally, um, just, just just have something, just have some fun with your students, right? They, they remember that, uh, it helps keep them awake, it helps keep them focused, and um, this is something that just got a lot of, um, a lot of coverage. Was it a couple of years ago, the relationship uh, is published in the New, New England Journal of Medicine, I think, um, relationship between chocolate consumption and uh, Nobel laureates. Uh, per, per capita, um, and obviously it, it wasn't that serious. Um, there was all sorts of flaws with the, the data. Um, you could have unpacked it in terms of um, you know the, the, the measurements that we use and, uh, and everything else. But you know, a lot of bloggers had a lot of fun with this, and they started um, saying, "Well, actually, I've got this paper on chocolate consumption and you know, number of rampages, uh, or number of uh, driving deaths, uh, and, and all sorts of other things." Um, you, know, you can you can still show you know, how regression works or uh, the flaws of regression analysis uh, based on um, some pretty fanciful uh, data. Um, I, if I can, I try to be current. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, I, I don't like to think of myself as uh, somebody who teaches quantitative methods that doesn't update, update their slides on a regular basis. Um, when you're teaching introductory, undergraduate, um, quantitative methods, then you know, this is not the area of uh, political methodology that, that needs updating every year, but your examples do. You know, if, if you want arresting examples, um, then a good way is, is to draw on something current. Um, I just happened to notice that this week uh, in my uh, in my slides that uh, the day after the Cypriot presidential election, uh, probably the only day of the year um, most German or British um, students may have paid any attention that particular race, um, I was able to uh, use that data to illustrate you know, uh, a mode or a, a frequent, relative frequencies or, or something like that. Um, so I think I probably used it to talk about relative frequencies, but the mode is important because, uh, because of the way uh, the election um, was determined in 2015. elected, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, again, yeah, this, is, this is not really related to uh, quantitative methods, um, but maybe quantitative methods um, is something that students struggle with. Um, maybe you can, you can just make yourself more approachable than a lot of quantitative methods teachers um, have been known for in the past. Um, just good advice, arrive early, leave late, uh, give students an opportunity to talk to you. Um, right? um, sometimes, sometimes I have some fun. Um, so, just this, was I teaching? Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday morning, somebody came up to me um, at the beginning of the lecture and he said, I didn't want to ask this question in front of uh, all the rest of the class, but it's, it's been bugging me all week. Um, I've talked to some of my friends about this, and there's just something about that you said as an offhand remark in last week's lecture that I can't work out. Can you explain to me why 
when women wear bikinis, more children drown. <laughs> and, um, and I just I thought that was fun. But he hadn't figured that out. And then when I told him he was, he was kicking himself, um, I was just very briefly talking about how we would talk about uh, causality later in the semester. Um, and you know, just gave me a chance to engage with that student, start a dialogue with him, and uh, have a little bit of fun. And, and you know, maybe that will make him uh, more likely to approach me when he's struggling later in the semester. Um, yeah, obvious um, Yeah, challenging the social scientist, you'd be amazed. I think you'd be amazed um, if you actually start putting questions to them. If you've just been talking about measurement, operationalization, reliability, validity, they start talking to them about something they care about in relation to what you just taught them about. Right? So, this, this is something I asked them about you know, after we've had a lecture, we've talked about these things. What are exams a measure of? And, you know, they have to think, and then they start wondering, and then they're not sure. What are they a measure of? Um, you know, are they a reliable measure of whatever they think it's a measure of? If they took an exam on uh, December the 10th, if they took that exam again on December the 11th or December the 12th, to get the same thing, um, is it even possible to measure reliability uh, on something like exams? Are they a valid measure of whatever they're a measure of? How precise are they, whatever else? Uh, and this is, of course, the really interesting one, right? It grades the dependent variable, uh, what are the key independent variables? And uh, the breadth of independent variables that students come up with uh, is, uh, uh, is entertaining. Um, yeah, this same sort of thing. Um, uh, almost certainly uh, a flaw in the way I teach is for years, I've, I, I've always had some students come to me and say, I don't really understand the difference between theory and a hypothesis uh, in, a, in a research design. Um, I, I thought I got it, but I don't. Um, and then at some point, um, I, I just found that this was really useful. To give them some hypotheses, and then have them think about what the theory that might explain those hypotheses are. Hey, I don't think most researchers understand what this is. <laughs> it's extremely common, I think, for researchers to say, like, they did a certain analysis and say, well, this was our hypothesis, and not realize that there are many different implications of the theories, and including certain contradictory implications. So you shouldn't be so hard on you. Your <laughs> students don't understand this point, but you scientists don't understand it. Well, yeah. I think you're right. But, um, so, uh, anyway, this I think kind of interesting hypotheses, the theories behind them. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but I have some ideas. Um, you'd be amazed. Um, you know, can you think of it? What's the theory behind why the men earn more than women? What do you think, Holly? <laughs> See, in this room, I knew I'd get the right answer. Uh, normally, when I, when I throw this out, I have to drag out of them um, some sort of uh, discrimination. Um, I always get 10 things before I get discrimination. You know, and then it, it kind of allows me to start talking about you know, blind trials of uh, orchestras, right? And, and the work that's been done in that area uh, to demonstrate how we have pretty good evidence that, uh, that there is such a thing as discrimination that exists in the real world and other things, right? So um, it seems playful at first, uh, but actually get some things in. And uh, whether or not they come up with the accurate theories is not as important as being able to then distinguish between um, hypothesis and a theory, or at least have a certain value. Um, yeah, th this wasn't something I realized until I went through my lectures.
predicting the, the presidential election in the United States in 1936. And the reason why you'll have uh, come across it, even if you're not a political scientist, is because it's an example in every single textbook. Um, I have seven or eight on my desk, uh, I, I think at some point I looked, and it is in all, uh, all seven or eight um, uh, as an example of that uh, sample frame. Uh, amongst uh, other flaws. Um, yeah, I, I talk about um, you know, flaws of question wording, we, do, we, we talk about questionnaires, we talk about data gathering processes, uh, obviously surveys is, is one we cover uh, quite a bit, and it's kind of it's kind of interesting, it's kind of enlightening to um, uh, just show them some, some questions that, that could have been worded better from, from surveys. Um, but then if you show them a question from a, a referendum in which I haven't the turnout here, but over 50% of the population went and voted on a referendum, uh, and then you start asking people, well, are there any flaws in that question? Um, it, it's very few people uh, manage to think uh, who can actually see that question and think that that's not a flawed question that went to the population of New Zealand a few years back. Uh, as well. The citizens' referendum, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't automatic policy, but it got enough, uh, enough votes to have been a meaningful political event. And then, of course, you can do the extremes. Uh, Internet-based internet all uh, that is used to show how bad it can be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I use many other examples of this. Uh, and one, of course, you probably all be aware of is, is the uh, public opinion polling that Karl Marx engaged in uh, in the late 19th century. That unfortunately, we haven't the data from, uh, but the, the loadedness of the question is uh, political parties, of course, it's, it's not just um, uh, political scientists that use bad data, uh, political parties have been known to use bad data. Um, we, we have a, a system now in, in the UK, it's, it's a wonderful resource actually, um, where, where we archive all of the local election um, uh, pamphlets and, and newspapers and leaflets uh, during the election campaign, and what it allows us to do is it sees, it allows us to see how much manipulation of data political parties get up to. Um, this seems to be the most egregious that I came across um, from uh, the 2010 election. This was taken from, I think, one of these uh, kind of newspaper type things uh, that was sent around by the Liberal Democrats, and, and uh, this sort of things we saw all over the place. Um, the um, don't vote Labour, Labour can't win here, vote for the Liberal Democrats to keep the Conservatives out. Um, you can see they have labelled this, the results are important. Uh, Forest of Dean by elections held the year prior, doesn't say anything about what elections or, or what have changed, but if you actually look at um, how the general election went in the previous, uh, the previous election, <laughs> it looks a lot different. Right? Um, surely a, a much better comparison about whether Labour can really win the Forest of Dean is how they did in the last general election, not a small, uh, non-random non selection of uh, by-elections that took place um, in which turned out was extremely low uh, the year before. Um, and the 2010 result, actually the, the order of the parties looked very much like that, but there was a huge swing away from one, uh, over 12 percentage points. Um, it went about half and half to each of the Of course, the media are um, <coughs> always easy prey for using bad data. Uh, here's some I, I just found from the United States. I know it's now all from the same source. Mm -hmm. okay. um, can't sum to 100. Um, that's fun. <laughs> Andrew's left now, and I'm sure Andrew would probably argue that there's never a good use of a pie chart. I kind of disagree. I think a pie chart's a good way of the distribution of seats in the parliament. Um, it's not a good way of, um, of showing the question in which it only shows gives and answers and more than three options. Um, uh, also, it's also the example where uh, you know, the, the, the graph doesn't actually trade the numbers, so 8.6%. Uh, would of course be the lowest point of the graph, not the same as 9%. Um, but you know, folks don't always get their data wrong. Sometimes they get it perfectly right. They just can't tell me between. <laughs> <laughs> Easy time. Yes. And um, yeah, with a, with a nod to.
to uh, to Brian Banker, uh, who's a, a postdoc in Oxford, uh, at some point, who, who, who turned me on to this, uh, which is the uh, it's a headline from the Daily Telegraph um, about extrapolation, uh, which I, I find just ridiculous. Um, the headline is, women athletes will one day out sprint men. What they've done is they've looked at the development of the world record in the 100 meters, and then they've just <coughs> drew lines all the way until they cross. Right? And they've said, by 2156, uh, women will be running faster than men. Um, I talk a little bit about prediction, um, but I talk a lot more about errors in prediction uh, than the Telegraph managed to do. Um, actually, like, if, if you want to kind of if you want to kind of accept this and take it further, if you only use Usain Bolt's uh, times for beating the world record and carry drawing a line, then actually the, the 100 meters uh, will be run in a negative time in, the, in I think, 100 years. Right? And I think 2013 uh, will be we'll be finishing 100 meters before we start. As a funnier example of that, I can't remember the source of the number of Elvis impersonators, which by 2020 will be, you know, one in three of us will be now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you can find it for that. I'm sorry, is that Elvis? Time Kids just don't have parties, right? So, um, the kids don't know who Elvis is. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we talked about. Um, uh, uh, criticizing uh, the research of others uh, this morning with, with Andrew. I tend not to like criticizing uh, the research of political scientists uh, in front of my um, undergraduate students. Um, I don't think it's a particularly productive way uh, of engaging with them. Um, but we can criticize uh, bad data. Um, this is not bad data, uh, it, it's, such, it's unreliable data. Um, it's recall data, and I've got lots of examples of bad, or rather unreliable recall data. This is just one I like um, a lot. Um, it's not deliberate, I have a lot of examples from uh, 1992, but I guess, I guess my age um, uh, could suggest that that is a bit of interest. Um, so we have a, a, a panel survey here, the British Council Panel Survey. It's a, it's a great resource for, for data, uh, and it's uh, subsequent, um, uh, it's subsequent uh, reincarnation. Um, but we asked, or, or they asked, um, a, a large sample of respondents in 1992, just after the general election, how they voted. Right? And the distribution is very similar to how people actually did vote um, in, in that general election. It's, it's more or less what you would expect, uh, within some acceptable value there. Um, but they continued to ask the question at two year intervals afterwards to the same people. So we knew how they said they voted just after the election. So we asked them a couple of years later, and um, you know, a few less people um, said they voted Conservative, a few more people had remembered voting Labour um, than, uh, than they had just after the election. And then, of course, things started to change. Uh, that particular government um, found itself embroiled in a number of scandals. Um, the, the new Labour project had made Labour much more uh, popular, at least in, in, in electoral terms. At the time that question was asked in 1936, well, you've got differences of, what, 10 percentage points, and uh, and 14 percentage points different, right? So you know, this would have been a huge uh, history-making uh, landslide uh, in an election that, that Labour actually lost. Um, it doesn't dem demonstrate bad data. What it demonstrates is that recall data of, of past behaviour is not a very reliable measure of actual behaviour. Okay, so that's uh, Sheffield and general tips done, and, and I'm almost done. Uh, I didn't make a note when I started, but I think I probably talked about should have done. Um, so at, at some point, I, I just moved. I moved. Uh, I moved from Sheffield. I moved to a completely different context. Uh, I, I moved to Mannheim. Um, if, if I'm going to be honest, I would say that the, the what I teach and the way I teach in Mannheim uh, is much better received um, than it was uh, in Sheffield. Um, I don't think necessarily I've got uh, better at teaching quantitative methods. I think what I've done is I've moved into a, a different institution um, with. Of working and different, uh, uh, different students uh, that are quite different. So, what have I done that's different that, that, that seems to be more appreciated? Well, firstly, I teach them all in a second language. Um, so, you know, if there's, we have correlation, I'm not sure we have causation. Um, uh, I teach them in English, um, I get um, students um, in the first semester, so their very first lecture, in fact, is with me. 
So their very first lecture in their very first day in their very first week at university is in a foreign language. <laughs> it's research methods and it's me. Um, who speaks you know, way too quickly uh, and uses a lot of slang and pop culture references. Um, it doesn't seem to happen. Um, if I'm perfectly honest, um, if, you, if you discount maybe the bottom 5% in terms of written exams, um, at the end of the semester, the standard of English is higher uh, than the previous institutions uh, I've, I've been at. Right? I, never, I never have to go, where's the apostrophe? Well, that's in the wrong place, right? <laughs> of and have is never wrong. There and there, too, too, is never, ever wrong. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a collection of verbs at the end of the sentence, but, uh, uh, but the standard of English is, is just ridiculously high, embarrassingly high. We need a research assistant. <laughs> Sorry? We need a research assistant. <laughs> um, maybe I should import them uh, <laughs> over here. Yeah, but it's, uh, I've got a lot of students, so it's a lot of marketing. So, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, I think we teach them earlier, and I think earlier the better. Um, uh, teach them in the first semester. Um, I, guess, I guess the video will be running long enough now that nobody will actually ever listen to this part. Um, so, um, one thing um, that I think really hampered us uh, at Sheffield uh, when we were talking quantitative methods was when we got them in the second year. Um, we, we got them after, in the first year, they'd been told that uh, quantitative methods was just uh, a small area of political science that was conducted by American right-wing uh, researchers. And the first one I heard this, I thought that's ridiculous, and I heard it from more students, and then at some point I just talked to the body of students about what exactly was said, and, and they all confirmed that this is what they heard, and so, you know, in general, uh, students at Sheffield tend to be uh, slightly left-leaning, and so uh, when, when they start learning something that they're told that it's something that right-wing people do, uh, it kind of just accelerates uh, their, their displeasure with that. Um, if you get them earlier, you don't have to deal. Uh, we teach them a lot more, 28 lectures, hour and a half uh, lectures a week, uh, much better than the 12 one hour lectures uh, taught before. Uh, plus, they get uh, quite a lot of workshops and data analysis and tutorials uh, in research and stuff. Um, fortunately, we can't vary the assessment, just end uh, one end of term exam. Um, I think that's, that's problematic. Um, and actually, I've come around to the teaching from formula with hand calculations. Um, but this is generally true. Like the, the, my favorite slide of my whole year is about three quarters of the way through, uh, through the lecture series on data analysis, I show them some stator output from the first slide on my lecture. And then I tell them, you can work that out by hand, that out by hand, that out by hand, everything. They can work everything out by hand. They've already done it over the previous nine or 10 weeks or so. And you can just see in their faces, oh yeah, because they remembered when they first saw that output, uh, they had no clue what all these numbers were. They thought, I'm never going to understand um, all of these numbers. Uh, and now they realize, I can actually work all that out by hand. You know, if Sean picks the, the cases and the variables and, and limits it to, to n of 5 and uh, 2 different variables, you can work that out by hand. Um, and, and of course, it's quite um, And of course, the students do. Um, they have maths um, in, throughout their secondary education right until they start university. Um, so they have um, is it 12 or 13 years of schooling, they have maths every year. They can't, like I did, uh, give up maths when I was 14 uh, in the British school system. Um, my eldest son, he's just started in fourth grade, fourth class in school, I was looking through his, uh, his book for the year um, uh, just a few days ago, and I saw they're learning probability. My nine-year-old son will be learning probability this year in school. I don't think I learned probability in the in the late 70s and the 20s. Can't say that's all. It came later. Um, so um, I, I think by next year um, I'll be done being able to help you. Um, of course, there's a, there's a selection bias. This is not typical German. I'm told uh, my home students know what that is all about. Uh, they self select into the program. And of course, there's also a reinforcement effect. Every other class they take at Mannheim will tell them that you need to understand quantitative methods if you want to succeed in my course. They get really into the full quantitative methods. Uh, it's, it's not the same uh, as, as many British institutions where that reinforcement effect doesn't tend to exist. Um, so, final slide. Um, what's the
the overall message. Um, take as much time as you're able to get. Uh, if there's any wiggle room, uh, wiggle for more time uh, with the students. Uh, it can only have a positive effect uh, on them uh, and on you. Um, kindly, get them as early as possible. Um, we did, as, as part of the project Catherine Aitney and I uh, did with the PSI, was we, we collected data on when and how other political science departments teach quantitative research methods um, to their undergraduates. Uh, and we found that quite a lot of institutions left it until the third year. It, it's, it's just too late. It's too late. They already know they, they already know what they call. They think they know what political science is or political studies is uh, by the time it gets to the third year. And it's just too late for them to actually use that knowledge in any constructive way in terms of um, writing uh, term papers or, or applying it to the thesis. Um, preferably get them in that first year. Um, use as much variance as you can uh, in, in everything you do. And of course, um, it's vital to, to add context. Um, lots of political science examples, um, but also from outside the academic realm, use examples from politics, or obviously if you're not a political scientist, use examples from uh, you know, sociology and psychology, that is outside of the academic world. And yeah, I'm going to end on a, on a really terrible uh, buzzword. Um, you know, it is a transferable skill, quantitative methods. You know, as much as we might dislike the phrase, um, it, it's one of the few obvious, useful, tangible, transferable skills they'll learn when, when actually um, uh, taking a social science degree. Um, and so you've got to stress that at every stage. You know, if you need to bring in um, representatives from employers to talk to them about how they can use it in that particular career, um, or if you have to uh, you know, demonstrate um, how it's going to be beneficial for postgraduate education, uh, then you should make the most of that. Thank you.